In the next uh, roughly one hour, I would like to show you where we are with OLED lighting, what OLED can do actually, and what are the um, kind of obstacles we are facing to get this wonderful light source into the market. Um, yeah, let's start first with a short introduction. Um, that's actually the uh, the way you see you have seen light uh, in the last years. It's a bright point somewhere hidden inside a system and um, not very pleasant to look in. So um, we rather like to see the light output coming reflected from somewhere. And now there comes OLED, and OLED is the first real full surface light source. It's a very pleasant light, and uh, it is, is really a revolution in lighting, so to say, because there's so much uh, attractive things connected with OLED lighting. Uh, the light itself is very pleasant. Um, the OLED is very thin. I'll come to that uh, later on in my presentation. Um, the uh, OLED is instant dimmable, so smooth dimming is possible. A switch on the power and there there is light. And um, yeah, it is very thin. Uh, um, so um, integrating is an option um, meant to be uh, used for OLEDs. Uh, in all, this new light source really um, features uh, also a no, new approach in uh, how to handle light uh, because now we don't want to actually hide the light source, we want to see the light thanks to OLED. Uh, before we go into details what we can do with OLED today, some, some words about why is it called OLED and, and what's behind it and what's the difference to other light sources out there. Um, first. OLED um, is kind of misleading because we are uh, actually uh, sharing three letters which are also shared by uh, the colleagues from LED. But as I said, we are not the next generation of, of LED. We are a totally new light source on our own. While you see traditional light sources and, and uh, LED um, comparable to uh, the bright sun in the sky, we are more like the light reflected by the sky, so very diffuse. Uh, well, the name is misleading. We are Obviously, a light emitting diode, but that's on a tactical way, that's correct. Uh, we are not using any animals or plants in there. That's O for organic simply comes become because we're using organic chemistry in there. And um, so all in all, um, kind of misleading. Um, many of you, of you probably have heard OLEDs for the first time in connection with this place. Um, and we are relatively new for lighting. Uh, if you see that uh, it took more than nine years uh, to get the first prototypes on um, all the displays, all the TVs uh, to the market, uh, then we are rather faster than all the displays because um, we were shown first time in 2008 and already in 2008 we were, uh, were able to uh, ship the first um, OLEDs to the market. Um, there are several uh, differences between OLED lighting and OLED displays. Um, those are most of the important ones, but I will make it more easier for you. Those are the three which are really count. Um, and the, uh, the upper one is really the most important one, because um, lighting is really about light. So we are already now 21 times brighter than any display out there. Also, when it comes to the pixel size, um, 12 by 12 centimeter, that's for Philips. There are other OLED manufacturers out there which are a little bit larger, um, but we want to be large, while the OLED display makers really want to have small dots in their small pixels to get the resolution up. And then again, one other thing, uh, defect tolerances, um, display makers are allowed to have on a certain area up to do that, that two depth pixels. Um, one OLED is one pixel, would be a great business case to sell um, that OLEDs, but obviously we want to sell light and not just mirroring uh, glass plates. Yeah, uh, how an OLED works is very easy. You uh, have to think of a sandwich, actually. Um, a sandwich, um, the first side is um, a glass plate, and on this glass plate there are, um, are several layers of different chemicals. Um, and to shield all those very tiny layers, I come to the um, dimensions we are talking about in a few minutes, uh, we uh, have to shield them with the uh, so-called thin film encapsulation. That's a new thing, actually, because um, until now, um, OLEDs were um, like a really like a glass sandwich. Yeah, the first side was glass, and the back side was also glass. But due for quality reasons, we switched to thin film encapsulation, which makes the OLED um, uh, better in quality, long livier in quality, and thinner. We are now down to 0 0.7 millimeters, which is... Um, incredibly thin. 
Uh, basically, when um, uh, you apply a current to that uh, to that uh, sandwich of uh, of different uh, organic uh, chemistry layers, then they start to light up. That's very easy uh, setup. You see that um, that scheme there uh, on the lower side. That's where the light comes out. Then you've got the glass plates, plates. You've got an anode, a cathode, and in between those. There are the organic layers. Up to 60 uh, we are using here at Philips. Um, I'm not sure about the other competitors out there, but uh, we are very much ahead when it comes to the stack development. Yeah, high tech at its best. Um, just to imagine uh, those layers in there are just 400 nanometers thin. That's incredibly thin. 400 nanometers, that's the 400th part of a human hair. Um, just to give you an idea how this um, relates in, 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 in normal sizes, if you have a human hair in front of the Eiffel Tower, then the Eiffel Tower is the OLED in all, so 0 0.7 millimeters, 0 0.027 inches, and the Eiffel Tower um, uh, and the hair is those, are those uh, layers inside the OLED, 400 nanometers. So incredibly dimensions, actually in the process, processes and during production, um, Atoms of those chemicals are evaporated and put on top of each other. So that's high-tech nanotechnology at its best. Uh, Philips is producing um, its OLEDs here in Aachen, where I'm sitting right now in Germany. We've got the largest um, clean room white for all the lighting panels, roughly 3,500 square meter. Um, we've got um, machinery in there for roughly half a, uh, half a billion of euros. The last edition was a 40 million um, uh, production line which is capable of um, producing OLEDs in a time frame of uh, two minutes per 12 OLEDs. So that's really something. It's really pushing OLEDs out in a big, big amount. What OLEDs general can do is uh, OLED can produce in any colors, in any white colors, for, ex for instance. Uh, we know that in Europe, for example, the people tend to love the warm white, while in Asia, the people love to tend to um, the greenish, bluish white. We can also do um, all colors. Um, the colors are really mixed into the uh, chemicals. So if you want to have a purple OLED, that's possible, not a, not a problem. And we can do, uh, generally you can do uh, shapes with OLED. So you see those Pac-Man goes there, different colors, and those eyes are not printed on the OLED. They are actually uh, inside the OLED, so we leave out uh, certain areas which should not emit light during the production process. Right now we are really um, looking into white OLEDs for functional uh, lighting, so we are... Um, offering those things, but we are producing at the moment um, tons of uh, white OLED for the mass market, or the soon-to-be mass market. Yeah, when it comes to the uh, emission spectrum, you see here on the right there's a typical uh, OLED spectrum. It's uh, totally different than a, a LED spectrum. Uh, with LED, you've got uh, sharp peaks. Here with the um, with the OLED, the uh, there are peaks in there, but all in all, it's a very white. Um, spectrum which makes the light um, so wonderful. Again, um, as I said earlier, the emission color is really material property, so we have to mix certain materials in to get certain colors. Um, and most of our white OLEDs contain a red and a green and a blue emission layer to create high light, uh, high white light. Uh, in uh, addition to that, OLEDs emit new, uh, no UV or infrared light, which is good in many cases. And the CRI of uh, 80 is uh, the standard at the moment. We are working on a uh, new OLED, a new uh, efficacy, which I'm going to tell you later on, which is going to be at around 90, so very high. Yeah, uh, what you see on the right, uh, the, the red, the better, I must say. So we are talking about homogeneity luminance. I mean, we are talking about a, a light source, which is wonderful because the homogeneity is so great, so unseen. Um, it's, it's, it's really a, a wonderful light source, and when you see that we are a Lambertian uh, surface emitter, um, that means that we have the same um, radiance when viewed from any angle. So that's, that's one of the key features with, with, with uh, OLEDs, and that's where OLEDs are really ahead of even small uh, metrics LED systems, because there you always see uh, the difference where is an LED lighting up and where is no LED. So that's really a cool thing. Um, and to achieve such high homogeneity, you really have to have the processes uh, right. Uh, production processes are really king. 
What you see on the right side um, is a typical production run of our OLEDs, and you see the scale on the left side is the important scale. You see that the uh, thickness of the layer is between 106 nanometers and 104 nanometers, so varying up and down roughly one nanometer max. Uh, this is very important because if you've got more variation on the thickness of the layer, the luminance is different, the color point is different, and the homogeneity can be different. And if you want to put out um, lots of OLED into the market, then you want to have lots of OLED who look alike because you want to use them together. So this is really, really important to have a, a very good production setup to get such, uh, such, um, such very small variations. Just to give you an idea what one nanometer means, here we go. One nanometer equals the same ratio like a hazelnut to the earth. That's the relations and ratios we are working here in the production. So we are high-tech, nanotech at its best. Yeah, and this is one, probably one of my um, um, uh, most important slides because um, obviously we are light source, but we have to think beyond light sources. We are actually a material which emits light. So start thinking about OLED using not only as a light source, but also using OLED as a material. So a totally different approach on, on a light source, never done before. And who knows, maybe in the future, um, furniture could look like this. When we think about um, how is lighting going to evolve, um, then we must say that actually there hasn't been any evolution at all. 1891 saw the first light bulb uh, really on the market, and since then the light bulb has been uh, on the market. There have been additions to the site for special um, special uh, usage and so on, but uh, without any band, the light source would, uh, the, the incandescent light bulb would still be in. Now, since 2005, the LED is on the market, and since 2014, the really good OLEDs are on the market. Um, and we say that this is really going to be a disruptive um, in input on the, uh, on the lighting sch uh, scheme, on the lighting revolution. We say that digital lighting will be the future. And we will see all other light so sources vanish sooner or later. And by later, I mean um, 2020, probably the latest. Both light sources, OLED and LED, can do the job all other light sources can have done so far. Uh, LED for spotlighting and uh, OLED for diffuse lighting. So the question is not uh, LED or OLED. The question is LED, or the answer is LED and OLED. That's the future of, uh, of lighting. Today's performance uh, of an OLED panel, I've got here our uh, Bright FL300, which is at the moment the brightest OLED in the world, up to 50 lumen per watt efficacy, uh, 8,300 candela uh, per square meter brightness, 10,000 hour lifetimes, and that means after 10,000 hours the OLED is not dead, it has still 70% uh, of its initial brightness. Huh? 0 0.7 millimeters th uh, thickness or thinness, I must say, 144 square meter uh, square centimeter surface square meter would be great but that's um, going to be in the future uh, also there are other light sources out there all it's out there also from from Philips which are larger but I have really concentrated on the functional ones because we think that functional lighting is the key door opener for all it into the market yeah market is a good question um, here is a little sneak peek on where we think OLED is today. Um, you see that coming from the top, um, we have seen uh, very expensive designish installations, in innovative lighting systems, architectural luminaires, very expensive, uh, very out of bound for the mass market. But you see that we come um, lower, 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 and there where the blue line is, that's today. So we're really moving over to the, to, to the, to the market where um, more OLEDs will be seen and more OLED will have an impact on our lives in a daily basis. If you take a look at the upper um, green, red and uh, yellow uh, line, there you see that in many ways OLEDs are already performing very well. Huh? We are only challenged by LED when it comes to lifetime and energy efficacy. efficacy. Um, and uh, what's not on the market really is flexibility or transparency. Uh, price is still an issue, but uh, we are coming to that one as well. When we go to the market development in the coming years, then you see here the three phases of OLED. Um, 
and where we are right now. Um, on the left side, that's really the early adoption phase, and you see the blue um, parts that architect that those are architectural and high-end luminaires installations. Uh, roughly 75% of the market were for those things. If you take your, the look on the right column, then you see that embedded OLED in buildings and in transportation will make up to 75% in the near future because we are now at the middle column moving to the right column. So there's a totally turnaround on the market and this is what it makes so, so important to be uh, aware that OLED is out there, to know what OLED can do and to prepare for the OLED market when it kicks in. And we expect to kick in this kick in to happen uh, 2016 to um, end of 2016, beginning of 2017. So very soon, it's, we're talking about a, a year, a half, one and a half year. <clears throat> um, also in the project, I will show you some of those projects we have done, just to give you an idea where we are evolving also with this project. This is a very uh, expensive car, Aston Martin 177, 1.7 um, British pounds, a million pounds. Um, obviously, they needed a very stylish installation. That's where all that came into place. Very expensive car, very expensive light source. Um, still, um, another um, installation um, done by a lighting architect in, in Berlin at Deutsche Bank headquarters there. Um, also at that time, that was 2012, very trendish and uh, very um, up-notch, huh? very ahead of the, of the market because at that time LED was just um, kicking in. Uh, installations which are interactive, this one is from a hotel in tai, tai, Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, also nice, but very expensive and, and, and really nothing uh, the ordinary person would hang in its uh, living room. Um, going cheaper with the modular system here, this one is actually from a, client, a customer of us in the Chicago area, hanging there in the, in the atrium, uh, consisting of 84 uh, modules with 16 OLEDs. The price there was already down to 3,500 uh, euro for the uh, 16 OLED module. Still high, but uh, only a tenth of the beginning in 2008. So we're really progressing there as well. And then finally coming into really applications. This is a uh, boardroom at Audi in Ingolstadt, Germany. Uh, there are OLEDs in there. Um, uh, Devil's Advocate might say, okay, there are so many um, OLEDs in there. It's easy to, to, to have so many OLEDs on the, on the roof and uh, on, this, on the roof and then um, uh, have the, um, the room lit up completely in OLED. Yes and no. Um, Audi um, has those many OLEDs in there because of the design, uh, which was their design, but they decided to um, actually dim down the OLED so that they are only running off a third of their capacity. So you see that already then um, OLED is bright. Same goes for cars. Huh? We, we started with fancy um, um, prototypes. This one is with transparent solar cells and OLEDs in the, in the, in the roof. Uh, we went over to designers um, going berserk with this new light source and uh, really thinking about the future of cars in the very far future. And now we're ending up with OLEDs in the backlight of an Audi TT, for example. You see how slim they are, how curved they are, transparent, um, wonderful looking. So 2016, we'll definitely see the first cars with uh, OLEDs in the back, um, bringing a revolution to the back side of cars. So very very cool stuff coming out there. Uh, and then um, also other areas where you wouldn't expect to all that actually bring safety and more beauty to. Uh, this is an emergency sign which we launched together with uh, Etap Lighting. Um, Etap Lighting, a Belgium company, is specialized on bringing innovative um, emergency signs to the market. They were actually the first to bring also LED signs in there. And the good thing about this is the quality of homogeneity. Um, this sign is 10 by 20 centimeters um, in, in its size and comparable to the same size of an LED emergency exit sign you see this sign three times earlier than any other sign that's because the homogeneity is so great so it's an active security and safety issue connected with OLED lighting yeah, but now um, truly functional oil lighting is the, the issue because where light is, you want to use light um, where you work, where you live. So can all it actually do that? Yes, they can. It. They can. Um, we introduced earlier last year the FA300. Um, I feature it here ex prominently because it's still the last, the, the world's brightest commercially available OLED panel 
300 lumens, 50 lumens per watt, so it's really a wonderful application. Um, we are also featuring it in three integration levels so that uh, everyone can actually use it. If you are a pro in, in, in connection with lighting and electricity, then you get the naked OLED. And if you are a good designer and would like to use OLED but have no idea on how to sold a, coal, uh, so a cable to the OLED, then you get it in a housing with the cables connected to it. So making it very easy to step into OLED lighting. Another one from our breed, uh, also featured because it's still the brightest decorative panel. The functional panels have an appearance which is uh, white when they are switched off. And all de our older uh, decorative um, uh, OLEDs were uh, reflective when they were switched off. Um, so we heard from customers that this uh, mirror-like eff effect is very, um, very, very, very cool. And they wanted to have that also with this um, new OLED we are bringing out to the market. So we reduced the white uh, layers there so that the mirror effect can, can happen and that reduces uh, the lumen output, but with, still with 190 lumen, this is uh, still the brightest decorative panel out there. And the effic efficacy is uh, with 30 lumen per watt um, still in a, in a good area. And I uh, would like to show you some of those uh, products actually using those OLED and that you get an understanding that um, the time is over for weight. Huh? So we, we have seen tons of designs never surfacing really in a, uh, in a product on the market. And uh, even we, are, we here at, at Philips were really sick of seeing wonderful designs but not making the last step. Now uh, with the FR300 and this brightness, um, there's a totally new ball game um, at play. And uh, you see all these luminaires I'm going to show you are actually on the market or coming to the market very soon. This one is actually the first Philips um, OLED luminaire. They're using four of our, our uh, FR300 in there. But uh, four of them together is too bright for them. So they reduced the brightness. So instead of uh, 1,200 lumens coming out of one of those modules, they only have uh, roughly 600 lumens light output. Uh, and by reducing the light output of OLED, that goes for every OLED, you can prolong the life. Now, instead of 10,000 hours, their lifetime is 50,000 hours and more. Huh? So that is a really tremendous thing with, with OLED. Um, if you don't um, have them all running on, on full power, they live long. This is another uh, luminaire coming out from a um, furniture maker, and this is actually the first electric product. They have never done any electric product before, and uh, they are very good in, in, in fine furniture. And they said, wow, this is such a cool uh, luminaire, uh, such a cool OLED, we would really like to make a very uh, slim uh, wooden uh, luminaire with that OLED, so uh, wonderful, we love it. And that's really the first product. So it's see, you see that OLEDs are all also opening doors um, for people never ever having to do um, with lighting before. So that's really cool too. This is not another uh, luminaire which is very really nice because the OLEDs are inside the glass and it's very slim. Uh, actually, it's looking much slimmer when you see it live, but this one, uh, this one is, is really the one of a, of, a, of a whole series by Thomas M., the German designer. He's um, um, bringing out his own series under the Omelette uh, label, and he's also producing for Luciplan. And those uh, luminaires are, uh, well, this one is actually one of the uh, most expensive one. It's uh, around 2,000 euros there, but his luminaires go down to 400 uh, euros, which is... Um, um, unseen before, when you think two years ago you would have to pay um, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 um, euros for a, uh, a OLED luminaire. So you see that there's also something in the works. And you can use OLEDs differently. This one is a new musical theater in, in Hamburg in Germany and they have used 500 of those OLEDs inside very bulky uh, luminaires and the, uh, of course we say we, we are so thin use us for integration, but the designer there said, uh, no, I would like to have those luminaires because they look better on that, um, uh, on that, uh, uh, on that wall in that theater because it's a curved wall. Um, but I need OLED because only OLED can really do the job in illuminating the, uh, the, the luminaires the way um, they are illuminated right now. The, he tried uh, a grid of LEDs and it didn't work, wasn't satisfied with the homogeneity. So here again um, shows that you can do uh, lots of things uh, with OLED. 
What happens next? That's probably one of the um, um, most um, um, questions, a question I get most um, asked. Uh, there are lots of things coming in. At the moment, we are not color tunable. That has um, a reason because um, the amount of light actually coming out of the OLED is just 20% of the light produced inside the OLED. So this means 80% of the light gets stuck in those tiny structures because the laws of physics apply everywhere, even if it's in, in one nanometer. So um, we know how to make color tunable OLEDs. Very, it's not very easy, but we know how to do it. And for doing it, you would have to put in more layers. And more layers would mean reducing the light output. So what we say is a, is a simple philosophy. We want to make the OLED first bright. And when it's bright enough to lose light output, then we can start deviation. And one of those things would be color tunability. And uh, we expect uh, color tunable OLEDs on the market, uh, also from other competitors, in two years from now. Uh, there's one competitor actually out there um, selling um, OLED lighting panels uh, which are color tunable, but he is actually cheating because those are not OLED lighting panels, those are OLED displays. Obviously, you can tune any OLED display in any color you want. The downturn to that one is if you run a display very long on the same color, it dies. So it's a very expensive um, 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 color tunable OLED uh, kind of thing. So. Um, down to that one. Then another one is transparency. You've seen we have had already transparent OLED in uh, the smart uh, prototype car there. Um, we have a transparency of above 85%. Uh, that is more or less window glass. You can't actually see the difference. It's, it's, it's really cool. Uh, there are some um, areas where we still research it, especially in the, um, in the lifetime of transparent OLED because transparent OLEDs live not as long as our normal OLEDs, so we um, have been offering those in, on uh, projects, but it's not in our portfolio. Others uh, do offer um, also OLEDs um, in transparent uh, form, but their transparency is not as good and they die uh, also very soon. Yeah, the next thing is really flexibility. Everyone is waiting for that one, um, but please, please, please um, do not think we you, you will ever be able to do the same thing you see the display guys uh, doing right now. So tweaking and jerking and folding a display is a totally different story than folding a, a, a plate uh, where there's a complete layer of, of, of light on it. Uh, actually, when you bend an OLED, or if you, if you could bend an OLED, it's now in rigid glass, but if you could bend an OLED, then at a certain point at the, at the, at the top of the OLED, there where the pressure is the, the, the most, uh, the layers would simply um, uh, uh, go apart um, and would never connect again because we're not flu uh, there's no fluid in there. So when you unfold it and fold it together and fold it back to the normal shape, you would see a, a black line in there which will uh, never ever light up again. So um, what we are going to see in the near future is actually bandable OLEDs so that you can put OLEDs on a curved background Bendable means 30 degrees angle up and down. That's the max where you can, can use it. And it's still on glass, not on plastics, because plastics can do the jobs, can do the job um, uh, glass can do at the moment. We need very tight glass uh, to, to uh, shield those uh, OLED layer from uh, environmental stuff, um, meaning water and uh, air molecules, not uh, water droplets or whatever. Yeah, size. Uh, size does matter, especially when it comes to lighting. You see there's our FR300 in the foreground. Uh, we are introducing very soon the larger format, uh, which is behind it, the, the strut one. And the future sees even larger panels out there. Um, and important there to understand is that um, we are really going with functional OLEDs. So this means that um, all larger OLEDs will also be functional. Uh, we could do larger surfaces already in decorative lighting, but we say functional lighting is really um, key uh, for bringing OLEDs into the market. And therefore, all our larger formats will also be in a functional uh, lumen output. Very important to understand that. Performance. Uh, just to give you an idea what's going on there, out there in the, in the OLED community, um, I can speak especially for Philips, obviously. Uh, in the last two years, we have tripled the brightness. Um, we started with 120 lumen, now we are 
300 lumens within those uh, two years and at 8,300 candela per square meter. Also, we are, uh, tripled the efficacy. We are now at 100 lumen per watt and we are currently on the way to integrate 100 in lumen per watt into our product line. It will take a little bit, but it will uh, happen. And actually, when this is in our product, the CRI will be of 90. So we are raising really the... Um, the, the level there because 80 an hour is, is really um, that what, what everyone shows but one word on CRI which is very important because we are a surface light source and that has to do with the Lambertian um, display as well um, if you put a OLED let's say with a CRI of uh, 80 next to a traditional light source um, also with a uh, CRI of 80 OLED will always look better because for the eye, the surface of light is always a nicer and better color than the point of light. So even if the color point is not as um, high as you have seen from other light sources, uh, we look better. Yeah, Lifetime is really not an issue, Mary, uh, issue anymore. You have heard about uh, 50,000 hours, so that's 50 years in normal household. So you actually would have to to get your kids um, um, with, w with you to, to, to buy the light source because it might be that they will inherit that light source when you die. So um, forget about any lifetime issues anymore. So learning of all what I've said so far is performance of all is okay to be considered for designs and projects. Huh? So um, there are uh, some downturns, i come to that later, but um, hey, we are not a, a lab light source anymore, we are out there. Huh? And the mass market is soon, soon to arrive. And uh, the next uh, images simply show what's going on and, 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 and how OLED lighting actually is going to change the way we all experience light. Just see this uh, setting here. It's a normal setting uh, in every any warehouse. You've got the clothing um, um, booths there. There's light everywhere, spotlight, dark areas. Uh, you've got this logos there where there's shade behind the logos. Now just imagine we do that with OLED lighting. Huh? So you've got the light integrated into the mirrors. Uh, you've got the logos lighting up themselves. There's OLED on the, on the, on the column there. A much, pleasant, much more pleasant um, light um, as you've seen before. Other situation, a bookstore, you see the shelves, um, obviously there's shade from above. Um, you've got this artistic thing hanging over that woman there. It's um, illuminated from the inside and casting shade all over the place. You've got this logo in front of that, um, of that uh, gentleman also illuminated from the backside. Now we go with old lighting. Undershelf lighting in the shelves brings light where you need it. Um, the uh, artistic thing is illuminated from itself because it's OLED. Um, so totally new way of uh, seeing light and, and finding light. Another one could be also uh, any store you think of. This one is now a shoe store. Uh, you see there's uh, curved displays which cast some, some shade because there's always light on the ceiling. Now with OLED we put the light behind the goods. Obviously when you have such a usage of OLED you want to have no blinding effect with the OLED and you can take care of that as well because you can simply dim, dim down the OLEDs and then you're fine. So uh, if everything is so great, um, the question is obviously why aren't we seeing any more OLEDs out there in the, in the nature? Why is OLED still somewhere cooking in the backyard? Well. Um, there are several reasons and um, we all have to, to, to face those reasons and some of those reasons are actually handmade because uh, when I read the media um, and they talk about what OLED lighting can do then it's really like reading a science fiction uh, uh, story. Huh? Uh, they talk about square meters of transparent OLED shielding the, um, the living room from the views from the outside and foldable OLEDs and cuttable OLEDs and so on. Obviously uh, this is very fascinating. So the customers um, have those images in their mind and what they want then is obviously a very big flexible and transparent OLED and they would like to cut it. Yeah, this is going to come in 10 years or so, but that's not there. Today what they get is a small plate of glass. No flexible, no transparency, no cuttable. So that's the reality. So um, obviously this is always a downturn because the expectations were so high and then we go and say, hey, sorry, it's just 12 by 12 centimeters. 
Another thing is the LED revolution. Um, lighting companies are still coping with the LED revolution, which is going on for 20 years or so, and uh, only now they have mastered to, to find the USP for, for LED systems. But it's not only the lighting companies which are uh, coping with that, it's also the customers of those lighting, cu uh, of those lighting companies. It's B2B and B2C, because also we are coping uh, with the LED revolution. To be honest, I don't have any single LED uh, source in my home. I'm still on halogen somewhere running. Because when do I change my lighting system? When I move or when it breaks down? And so then it's, it, it's, it's, it's changing time. So the LED is, is, is really um, in, in mind of everyone and, and no one is really thinking about what's coming behind the LED. So that's one of the biggest issues actually. And um, also the um, LED uh, benefited in many ways from the LED displays. But uh, OLED displays and OLED lighting, uh, the takeover is by far smaller and less straightforward than it has been with the LEDs. So that's also an issue. Another issue is that um, at the moment um, we have to compete, OLED has to compete with other uh, issues inside of um, companies. For example, the small building thing or the Internet of Things, just to name a few. Those are also in the mind there and the resources are not given to all those three, for example. It's either, okay, do we OLED or do we smart building or do we smart building or do we Internet of Things? So uh, this is also a factor where um, OLED is really... Um, uh, competing inside those companies. So that's really one issue. Another issue is, and that's very, very important to understand, is that OLEDs are no late bloomers at all. If we look at the LED revolution, then there were actually three phases. One Phase one was technologically driven. So they came up and said, hey, we found this very tiny light source and it's bright and we have no idea what to do with it. That was the first phase. Then took years to master certain processes, certain colors, and then there uh, have been the first prototypes. And then, hey, we've got the first prototypes with this very tiny light source. Okay, they are prohibitive expensive, but hey, they are there. And only now, roughly 20 years uh, later, after the first phase, there's phase three. And now we find new solutions, new features, and functional USPs you can only do with LED and no other light source. I just saw recently a video about Boeing uh, delivering a Boeing, I think it was a 787 or whatever, to um, Iceland Air. And Iceland Air has uh, ordered a very special ceiling inside the plane, mimicking the Nordic light. And this is only doable with LEDs. You couldn't do that with any other one. So this could be a functional USP. I don't know if it's really a killer application because they're are no, not so many um, planes uh, actually um, um, built every year, so it's not the mass market. But anyway, it's a market. And for OLED, OLED has to go through all those phases again. But for some reason I don't understand, everyone thinks we can skip phase one and phase two and directly start with phase three. Uh, we are very fast. When you see that 2008 has seen the first OLEDs, uh, on on, on uh, experimental level out there in the market, and we've got now seven years later, we are out there with luminaires, with solutions, and so on and so on. Then we have mastered those two steps very fast in comparison to the LED. But nevertheless, functional USP um, for OLEDs are still going to be to, to to be delivered. Obviously, when if we would have really functional USPs that would help to win the battle against price and performance issues where we're always up to. But at the moment, we simply have not found those really USPs. So we are a very cool light source. We are a very thin light source. We see new designs coming to the market, which are way cool and have never done before. And there are so many uh, things which could be done with, with OLED. But the killer application where everyone says, yes, you can only do that with, with, with OLED, um, it's... We wait for it. Huh? So it's not happening at the moment, but it will happen. Pricing. Yeah, pricing is always an obstacle, absolutely. But um, obviously, we are always compared to LEDs, which is simply unfair. Uh, also, this 1,000 lumens per dollar, what does it cost? Yes, we are more expensive on the 1,000 lumens, but forget about that. Um, don't compare us with LEDs, because that's simply unfair. If you just think that 
For example, if you would like to make a down light with LEDs, then it's not just the light source which you have to pay. You have to, the, to buy the LEDs, you have to buy the casket where it comes into. You've got the, all the, the parts which belong to that luminaire and so on and so on and so on. So it's much more than just the lumens price per, per dollar which actually count. With the OLED, you can forget about all this because the OLED is already diffuse. It comes diffuse by nature, so you don't have to put any optics or whatever to it, you just have to have a, a socket and that's it. So it makes it easier, it makes it better in quality because less things in the luminaire mean less thing can broke, break. So that's a really uh, a, a, a wonderful thing. And when you come to the pricing, yes, we are more expensive than LEDs. We are new technologies which is on the market, but I can tell you, for example, 300 lumens two years ago would have cost you 530 or more than 530 euros to read 300 lumens. Today, in a certain package, we have several um, um, sales promotions going on. You pay for 300 lumen 53 euros. So that's a tenth of that pricing two years ago. If that is not a price drop, I don't know what a price drop is. And actually we are really moving even further because with more production kicking in, more products on the market and more products really produced on mass market scale, the prices will go down. It's, 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 it's very easy. So that's um, really that one. So quality is also an issue. We have seen um, that um, some OLEDs out there in the market are really not living up to the price the companies would like to have for that. They've got um, blackouts, they've got black spots. So quality must be a key feature with OLED, especially when we are still more expensive than any light source which is out there on the market. And we have looked into um, how to make OLED better in quality. And uh, one issue was, for example, um, I told you earlier that the OLED in the past have been derived from two glass plates which were glued together to shield the inside. And if you take a look at that picture there, on the left side you see those black, black spots and you see the red line. And the red line shows you after how much hours you are going to start black spots because you never can seal the black glass so by 100% to the, to the front glass that there is no air or molecules coming into the, uh, sneaking into the OLED and really uh, attacking the, the layers. So we came up with this thin film enca encapsulation, makes the OLEDs thinner, so instead of 1.8 millimeters, we are now to 0.7 millimeters. And on the back side of the OLED, there's no glass, but there's a, um, yeah, a foil actually attached to that, uh, to cover that. And you actually you can bend the OLED as much as you can, you can't lose that connection. You see also, the black line, you see there are almost no black spots appearing even after 100,000 hours. So this is really important that the quality of OLEDs is up there. And another issue is there that there are no norms out there for tests on lifetime and other related um, specifications on OLED. Uh, Philips is really aggressive, aggressive, aggressively pushing into many uh, areas that norms are out there because the customer really needs to see uh, and to see what each OLED can do and what are really the features of the OLED. If you um, take a look at most of those technical specs out there, it's really like a um, guess this could be right, but you don't know. So this is really something which has to change as well to get the customer down there. Also, uh, information and support. There, there is hardly anything out there on the internet. There are a lot of myths out there on the internet. But if you're really looking on, 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 on support and information, then there is almost nil. So we try to change this as well. Uh, you're sitting right now in a webinar, um, listen to me about what OLED can do. We have many workshops going on. We've got a workshop here in Aachen where people actually fly in from Australia uh, to get three hours of OLED introduction, which shows us how important information and ambassadoring on OLED lighting is to the market. Not only to the end customer, but especially to those folks out there who are using our OLEDs for their designs and for their products. And therefore, we also have derived a whole variety of uh, information uh, products. We are starting, for example, with a, with a product sheet, which has only four pages, but which gives you a very basic introduction on what this OLED can do. If you would like to know more, you can 
have a 27 pages or even more pages um, um, data sheet, technical data sheet, where everything is in there. And if you would like to know how to design in those OLED into your product, there's a 40 pages design in guide available. And we are giving those things away for free. Just go to our website, there are download links, download the PDF, be happy and start designing your OLED light sources or, or your OLED light uh, thing design today. It's, it's very easy. Also webinars, this webinar for example is going to be recorded so you can listen to it whenever you would like to. There are other webinars out there, there are even workshops on the internet where we tell them what to do. So everything is out there, sample web, web shops where you can order your lighting, um, uh, the, your, uh, your OLED lighting um, um, sample to experience OLED lighting in your office or at home. So this is really uh, what is needed. So. Coming to a summary, uh, clearly uh, the question is, are we a light source to be used today? Yes, please use us, use us, but don't think of OLEDs as the holy grail. We are, we, please do not exaggerate and, and, and please do not put OLEDs against LEDs in view on cost and efficacy. Um, we will not win this at the moment. It's a totally bit different ballgame in two or three years when we picked up there, but at the moment costs, yeah, we, we only can lose. Uh, it's not about the costs. It's it's really about the uh, obviously it's, in many cases it is about the cost. But it, think about the the, the the features you can get, the quality of light you can get, and so on and so on. And if you try to go into building luminaires or designs using OLEDs, don't think about the future. Don't use things which are not on the market. Use those things which are on the market. They are already cool enough to make wonderful things. I've seen many of those things and they are all wonderful. And remember that being one millimeter thinner than any LED luminaire might not be the killer app, uh, especially when the electronics are rather thick. However, I must say, um, we used to say that LED drivers do the job with OLEDs. That was okay, but we came up with an old uh, own series of um, uh, OLED electronics because only with those electronics you can really unleash the po full potential of OLED and um, those are actually much smaller than most of the LED drivers out there. Uh, matchbox uh, size that's a uh, driver for one OLED so really really cool. Yeah in a summary um, and this brings me always already to the end uh, you see that um, OLED is just more than another light source. It's a material which emits light and it's really the last revolution in lighting because um, LED and OLED will do the job. I don't know of any other lighting thing out there which might uh, be the next thing. Obviously, I'm not, uh, I cannot look in the future, but uh, on the physics level, everything has been sorted out. Uh, so um, we are extremely thin, easy to integrate. This is really one of our features where we really would see more integrational stuff happening out there. And we are here today. Uh, we are not a hidden lab light source. We are really out there on the market. And um, we have good performances. We are okay with brightness and efficacy. So please start using OLEDs. It's, it's a really cool thing. Yeah, uh, if you want to uh, experience more on, on, on um, OLED lighting, then here are some links. Um, and if you've got questions, simply mail to us. But I would like to do a Q&A if there are questions coming. Thank you so much. Until now.